Welcome to the Outside the Business Boxes podcast, where we're talking about how to ignite your business today for the future using systems for everything you do in your business to make your life, your employees' lives, and your customers' lives easier for you to ultimately enjoy your business and, of course, make more money. I'm your host, Chad Murray. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming outside the Business Box podcast. I am your host, Chad Murray. Uh, another good friend of mine coming on here. Uh, we've known each other for, I don't know, not quite a year now, but we've struck up a great friendship. Yes, he is in the fireplace chimney world, but he's more than just that. I mean, it's it's Darren Bebo from National Chimney. I mean, my nickname for him, and I hope this keeps going and getting out whether he likes it or not uh is bad mr badass i call him mr badass and so i just wanted to kind of you know you want to know who darren bebo is other than if you're in the chimney world to buy from national here's his here's his bio right here his bio right here is uh, you know it, it's his press release about him you know he was raised in, in plattsburgh new new york he joined the coast guard uh and he was in a recruit company, Delta 144, the Coast Guard. I mean, you can just keep reading about this guy, what he did during 9-11, before 9-11, after 9-11, got in with the CIA to do a special operator stuff with them. You know, the guy just keeps going about all this badass stuff he did. So what did he do? Is he wrote a book. Why wouldn't he? I'd write a book too if I had that kind of stuff in my life that I could go out and show but it's just, it's more about that. It's more of what he brings to the to the world just as himself. Culture, you know, re- accountability. I mean, the, the guy the guy is just out of this world on accomplishments. And he doesn't tell you that. But I will tell you this. Everything you can read about this book, if you don't know who he is, you're going to call him Mr. Badass too. So without further ado, let's get into it with Mr. Badass. And, and, and here he is. Hey everybody, here we're here with Darren Bebo. He owns Nash or is a partner in National Chimney. He is a coach, he is a mentor, he is everything in a badass that you know. If you read his book, he has a book out called Back to Bulletproof. I I, I got the fortunate to read it and and wow, is it awesome. Hey Darren. How you doing, buddy? Good. Good. To see you. So we, I'll just tell everybody, we just spent 15 minutes horse shitting around talking, and I just said, okay, we got to get to this thing, so let's start talking now. Yeah, and so, so we, we started recording, we already had 15 minutes to talk. <laughs> we, we do. And so we actually had tears and we had laughter, we had everything in 15 minutes. But uh, so let's just get off with the book. If, if you guys don't, if you're in the industry or you're not in the industry, because you know, I have other people listening to me that are not just. Uh, uh, chimney companies, they're, they're business people as well as service companies in particular generally. What What is your book really about? And tell me a, a little bit about uh, what, what, what am I going to get out of reading your book? Well, I think the elevator speech, is, as people like to say, is um, I wrote the book. It's, it's about my story. However, I think it relates to a lot of people. Um, and it's not, a, it's not me just talking about what I've done, but it's what I've been able to do from the time I grew up, from my family life, living in the Adirondack Mountains, which is a small area in northern New York State, just south of the Canadian border, uh, playing hockey, and then going into the military, and then after the military, going into contracting for the CIA uh, overseas, and then coming back, uh, and then getting into the business world. So getting into the business world, I've taken a lot of the skills that I learned in the military, and I've implemented them into the business with my business partner, Marty Fuller. <clears throat> we own National Chimney and Natural Light Energy Systems. So we're business partners. He's a great guy, great mentor. And um, so I talk about, um, you know, core values. I talk about getting shit done every day. GSD, it's a way of life. Um, and, and basically that's what the book's about. I think you'll, people that will read it, whether you're in business or you've kind of lost your way a little bit, it'll get you back on track. And I'm not going to say it's 100% motivational type of book because it's not there's there's some skills in there that I'll teach you that work for me by reading the book however that doesn't mean it's going to change your life I, I wanted to find a lot of positive feedback from people all over the country that have bought the book and said you know what this really helped me 
do this, or this really changed my life. And in my mind, that wasn't a section of the book that I really thought was going to be mind-blowing to someone. But everyone gets something different, you know, all these little nuggets out of the book. And some people will tell me something where I'm like, well, yeah, that was what the message was. I wanted you to get that. And then other people tell me something like, I reference washing dishes, and we can go over that in a little bit. Um, and I reference washing dishes as a chore in her house. And I, I, I couldn't believe how many people hit me up on, like, Instagram and DM'd me. And they were like, oh, that's amazing, you know. That, that's what I want to do on everyday GSD. And uh, so, yeah, that's what the book's about. Okay, give the one thing about what GSD really means. Because I will tell you, I'm not stealing it, but it's already part of my vocabulary. <laughs> so everyday GSD stands for get shit done. That's right. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple way of life when you get up in the morning and you just get after it. And it's everyday. So everyday GSD. Half of my clients last week heard me say it. <laughs> <laughs> they did, and I'm like, "Well, GSD," and I, I forget the everyday. I just say, "I just say GSD." I was like, "Get shit done," you know, and, and they're like, "What do you mean?" Yeah, it's, I actually, I trademarked everyday GSD. I was surprised no one had it. I was like, then I realized, you know what? So people aren't aren't doing it. I mean, so I have to pay you now every time I say it. No, no. <laughs> spread it like wildfire. If we had more people getting shit done, we'd be, we'd be all in a better place. Yeah, no, no <laughs> kidding, no kidding. You know, it's you know, it's interesting about the book. You know, uh, I I was in the wrestling world, but mm-hmm. I grew, but I, but I I hung around the hockey players. So I mean, I can actually handle a stick better than a lot of hockey players because I played I I played in the uh, uh, alleyways with all the hockey guys. You know, just in our old moon boots back as a little kid. You know, in the in the in the early eighties, all the way through high school. You know, we got bored. You know, in Wisconsin. You know, all the alleyways are ice. And so yeah. we would be out there in our boots and all all decked up with the sticks. And I, of course, growing up with them, I learned how to do it. And and uh, I wasn't able to. So a funny story in second grade, uh, I went to my mom and I said, I want to join the hockey. And so there was a pamphlet and, and half one side was hockey from the YMCA and the other side was about wrestling. And at the bottom, and you know, you know, as you're, as you're a parent, they bring you something, you look at it, you go right to the bottom, what's it cost, right? What's it cost? <laughs> what's it cost? So she didn't care. I mean, you know, whatever. So cost of hockey in the 80s was still like 300 bucks. And for a single recently divorced woman, 300 bucks was like $3,000, right? In yeah. 1980, right? So she flips it and it says wrestling, 30 bucks. And she goes, don't you think you'd like to wrestle? And I went, no, I want to play hockey. She goes, yeah, but in wrestling, and this is my mindset of an eight-year-old, in re- and my mom says something like, in wrestling, you get to actually beat people up. And I went, okay. And I didn't, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't really know what hockey really was at the time. You didn't realize you could do that in hockey too. <laughs> yeah, I did. Well, I didn't realize it. You know, of course, you know, I could see the, you know, hitting people on the boards, but I never, you know, incorporated it to. I actually get to kick the shit out of people on this wrestling thing, and so, so I joined wrestling, and you know, went through that my whole life. But, uh, you know, but I. But I didn't. So come, come uh, ninth grade, all the hockey players were beer drinkers, and all the wrestlers were pot smokers. I'm not a pot smoker. I'm a beer drinker. And so, who do I naturally, you know, start hanging out with more? It was about seventh grade. I started hanging out with the hockey players more. But ninth grade high school, you know, when everybody comes together from all the little middle schools in our town, it was like, right. okay, I'm a hockey guy, although I'm a wrestler. It's so, you know, so, you know, it's funny, like, you know, anyone knows, I mean, I went to Tennessee to see Stoner a couple weeks ago, and what do we do? We go to two hockey games. <laughs> he has yeah. season tickets, right? So we, we go to two hockey games, and they were playing Dallas, and Dallas lost in a shootout. It sucked, but, uh, and, you know, I'm not a huge hockey fan because I don't have time for a whole lot of sports, but I do love hockey, but. And it's a great sport to watch live. Oh, absolutely. And I asked Mark, I said, do they... I asked Mark, do they hear live? Do they have the, is the puck yellow? Does it light up yellow? Uh, like, yeah, and he's like, no. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, come on. I, I, you know, I can't watch it like on TV then. No. But, uh, you know, it's great about the hockey in your book. You know, you talk about uh, a little bit about that and how that progressed you into, you know, to who you are a little bit. Today. It's kind of the start of the story, right? Is how yeah. you went into hockey. And so... Uh, sports is a sports really is a big thing in how you become a leader. Oh, absolutely. And I think that I mean, am I wrong? Is that kind of where you started started really knowing what a leader was? Except for you talk in the book how you had an aha moment, 
and I think your aha moment to become a leader was was what when, when you were in not basic whatever you call it for the Coast Guard. I can't remember the story in the book, but there was a moment that you talked about it that you had that aha moment of okay, this is me or something. I don't remember exactly. You have to read the book, I guess. But yeah, but I, I think growing up playing sports in general is, is good for kids, right? And and hockey because it's a team sport. You know, when you have a team, you need a leader, and the team's only as good as its weakest link. So, you as a leader, if you're the captain of the team or assistant captain or a good contributor, you're always going to try to develop the person that's let's say not the best skater or someone who needs a little more help because you want to have a winning team. Right. At least when, when I grew up, I know it's a little different with kids today, but I, we always want to win. Like losing sucked, and I, you know, second place is first place loser. That's how I would. That's how we grew up when I grew up, but. Um, so I, I think it's important if you have kids that they are in sports, and it doesn't mean they have to be the best hockey player out there. It can be any sport. It can be any sport that allows them to um, meet other people, develop their skills, and it's only going to help them grow up when they get older because typically it's pretty rare that you work completely by yourself, unless you have an isolated job and that's specifically what you're doing. But typically you work with other people. And if you work with other people, are you going to be led by them properly because you have a good attitude, or are you going to be the leader? Both are great positions to be in. You, you need you need people that can be led as a leader, and you need to have a leader to lead the people. Right. So it, it's kind of a two way street. So yeah, I think I was very fortunate to have coming from a hockey family. My brother played hockey. My dad played hockey. Everyone in my town pretty much played hockey. And if they didn't play hockey, they were at the hockey games cheering on all the hockey players. You know, and we had other sports, obviously, with football and soccer and, you know, all the regular school sports. But, um, but hockey was, it's a hockey town. Right. Well, I mean, North North isn't, you know, up in North New York, isn't that yeah. kind of a hockey space or a hockey place up there? Yeah, I mean, it's, we have ice rinks everywhere. It's cold yeah. all the time. And in the summer, we're playing hockey. <laughs> so, I mean, moving on, I mean, and I don't want to just be about the book. So, I mean, if you if you read the book, you're going to find out he was a special operator for the Coast Guard, which was, if you've never heard of what that is, it, it is it is probably the most badass thing I've ever heard of that I didn't know existed. I mean, seriously. I mean, when you hear his stories, which I don't even want to get into them because you need to read the book, uh, it is phenomenal. And I actually told my best friend who was actually our – our center uh, uh, at, for our hockey team that I grew up with since I was, you know, in first grade. Uh, I was finishing your book. We went and played golf uh, the other uh, last Sunday, and I said, "You got to read this book, man. You're gonna love it." Because he's also a manager of, of, of a big place, and I'm like, "You're gonna get management. You're gonna get leadership. You're gonna get all the badass hockey stories. And you're gonna get wartime stories. I mean, and then you then you get to all the leadership at the end. And it's like, I mean, you're gonna love this book, and and and." Uh, he hasn't told me he's bought it yet, but I'm going to hammer again this week and it's like, you got to but read this book. Nice. And so, nice. but yeah, you know, so a, as we move forward, you know, I, what I found interesting about the book, you know, I mean, you talked about your 9-11 experience and you know, you know, I had, you know, Admiral Boomer on, uh, I call him Admiral Boomer, Shuffle Bean, uh, right Beam, yeah. and, uh, and I mean, what a great story that is, but you have a great 9-11 story. So if I'm going to say anything, give us a, the elevator story of that. Just a quick, uh, well, what happened on you on 9-11? Uh, I mean, to make it a short story, it's kind yeah, of tough. Yeah, short. short. I mean, I'll make it real short. So um, my team had just got back from a huge strike bus in South America, and the towers got hit. We got called to go to the our office, which we had this little office in Opelika, Florida. And uh, then we put teams together, and then we flew straight to New York and started searching boats and detaining people that shouldn't be there that were potentially going to do more harm and hazards to our country. And, um, yeah, I was there for about 60 days after 9-11. I was there directly after uh, the towers got hit. So within within two days, I think. Um, yeah, and my team was 401, which is a special operations team that the Coast Guard has, and they're still around. They've got eight or nine teams on the East Coast, same thing on the West Coast. They've just separated MSRT and TAC. So but that's in the book, but um, right. yeah. So uh, it was it was very um, very unusual times for sure, especially being there and seeing the smoke and everything smoldering. Uh, yeah, it, it was fucking wild, man. You know what's crazy about it, and and I don't want to get political because we both have the same views. I know, 
You know, it's, it's how people have forgotten about it already. It just fucking blows my mind. You know, how can yeah. you forget where we were that day and then the months following and then where we are today? It's just, it just really is just. So what I've done is I focus on this podcast and my life and to not worry about it politically. So hopefully I can make enough money to no matter how much they're going to take from me, I have enough to live with. So <laughs> that's kind of my goal. Um, but as, as we sit here and we, I mean, and, and so Darren does own a large uh, and, and a really awesome distributorship uh, that sells to our industry. Um, so if you don't know who National Chimney is, and quite frankly, Honestly, I mean, I, I really, I hadn't been to to that half of the world to start buying from you. And until we started doing it, it's like, what a great company. I mean, you guys really, really deliver. And I really do. Not that at the other, not that I don't know some of the other owners of the distributors, but I know if something happens in the future, I know I can call Darren and go, hey, man, what the fuck's going on here? You know? Oh, absolutely. And so, and, and he invites that. He tells you that when, you know, when you're, when, when, when you talk to him about signing up. So, uh, that's that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, my business partner Marty Fuller started the company in 1991. Obviously, I came in many years later, but um, he, he's a great guy and he had a great vision for the company. And then we both have uh, different skills, for lack of a better word, and uh, we just complement each other excellently. And I've got an amazing team. We've got nine factories around the country, about 300, a little less than 300 employees. And you know what? When a customer has an issue, if if my team can't fix it and they come to me, I want to know why we couldn't fix it because everything is fixable. We're going to make mistakes, but how how well you can correct them, and I can guarantee you that if it comes to me, it's going to get corrected better than any other company because I, I, we're active. We're, we're involved with everything that goes on. <clears throat> One of my sales pitches, and it's not a pitch because it's the truth, but you label it as a pitch, is when we're talking to people, uh, customers, is we say... And, and I admit it right up front. We're not we're not perfect, but it, it's what when something happens, does the company do to make sure that they be as perfect as possible at the end game? We're not ever going to give up on you ever. Right. It's going to go till it's perfect, no matter what. And I have never failed at that course. And so th- this doesn't come out like in our in our scripting or anything. However, I've trained my guys if. Someone is on the fence and just they're worried about a job because at times we have that. You know, we're, we're estimating $20,000 relining and everything, half for rebuild and all this stuff. You know, they're like, gosh, I, you know, you know, we've had such bad you know, issues with other contractors. And our sales guys, our educators are just flat out say, you know, man, look at you. You looked at our reviews. You looked at our stuff. But here's here's what our promise is. Our promise flat out is when we're done, it's perfect as perfect as it can be we will not give up until it's right and so when there is a mistake we will fix it not that there's a lot but if there is and it's not to what your specifications are as long as it's you know something that we might have done wrong it will it'll be corrected and well, and the thinking business right and this is what confuses people so you're at mrs johnson's house mr and mrs johnson's house and you go there and you make a mistake but that was the first job you've ever done for them and you made one little mistake out of everything you did at their house, but they that's what they remember, right? They remember this mistake. You could have done 50 jobs before them and didn't make one mistake, but maybe one of your new technicians slipped up on his training and just forgot something, or he did something or she did something just a little different because they thought it was the right way to do it, but then it didn't get quality control checked. But then all of a sudden the homeowner calls you up and says, hey, I just hired you guys, and this is what happened. So that's the memory they're going to have if you don't fix it. Right. But if you go back immediately and make that a high priority, fix whatever the mistake is, apologize, say, hey, listen, I'm not making excuses, but here's what happened. Here's how we corrected it. Here's my n- number. We're looking forward to coming back next year. You know what that homeowner's going to remember? Hey, they're, they're not even going to remember the mistake. They're going to they're gonna tell their neighbors, say, hey, this company came over. We had a couple things that we wanted different. They came and fixed it immediately, and then it's a home run. Happy customer. Happy everyone. And then you know what? They start telling their friends. And then you got a good business rolling. A couple of years ago, I got into callbacks for some reason. I don't remember why I was doing them. I think I was actually training a, an educator how to do his callbacks. And we were calling back, and this one lady uh, answered the phone, you know, introduced who I was, and she actually knew who I was. Uh, and and then I, and I said, you know, we'd like to get you back on the schedule, you know, blah, blah, blah. And plus you have an open invoice here that you never got all the work done. 
And she's like, yeah, we, we, we are budgeting. We were actually looking at calling you here in the next few months or weeks or something. And she goes, and she starts telling us the story, telling me the story of how the last time we were there, we royally fucked up her, Jimmy. We did something really bad. And, and, and I did know about it, but I didn't know it was her. Like, when I called her, I didn't know it was her. Like, I didn't go down into the notes and read about it. And, 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 and when she started telling me, I, I, my first gut reaction was, oh, shit. I mean, how am I going to handle this lady? It was, where is she going with this, right? Yep. And so finally she goes, but you guys handled it so good. We love you. We're going to use you forever. When can, I, when can I schedule? Blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, I'm looking over at the guy I'm training. I'm like, See, you're working. You're starting for a good company. See, you don't like that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, that's good. And, and, and it's funny. I have a. I probably told this in one of my earlier podcasts that there. I love bad reviews. I. I mean, I don't want a lot of them, but I love them because if you just keep having a company having five star reviews, at some point in time, it looks fishy. You know, if you got five hundred five star reviews, something's weird. Like you're like somehow you're able to filter, or you've got some system that's not showing the public. Everything you do, because if you get to five hundred star, five hundred five reviews, and you don't have a four point five or even a one, eh, yeah. I feel it's a little weird. So when I get them, I flat out will obviously call them and, and and talk about. I already do it. So I had a one star review. I don't know, maybe four years ago, and the lady was dead on. I mean, we we didn't do a good job for her. It wasn't Chris critical. It wasn't like. Like this, you know, just crazy burn house type of scenario. But, but we definitely we had some issues. So I called her up and was talking to her. And, and, and I'm sorry, I did not call her up. I called her. She didn't answer. So I got on the Google and I responded to her, please call me. And I even put my number on there, even on the, and everything. I said, I'm the owner. You know, la, da, da. I, I just, I want to be able to take care of this. Please don't let this go. Well, the next day she calls, and and I and we fix it, and I didn't. So we fix it. I left it at that, and I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go edit my mine to to show people that she called. So I went down and wrote update underneath what I said. I said Mrs. Smith did call me, and we ended up working it out. Blah blah blah. Da da da. She ended up then updating her review from a one star to a four star, and she said. They're really a five-star company, but I'm only going to give them four because they did do a boo-boo, but, they, but the way they handled it, they are a five-star company. That's her review online right now. I love it. And I did. I just it's absolutely real, love it. It's a real review. That's the thing. Well, it shows I worked it, too. I didn't just... That's, that's, that's I real life. Yeah, I showed that it wasn't a review, and I went... Like everyone else on the way, I just gave the finger to the, to the, to the thing. And I wasn't doing... You know, that's... I wanted to take care of my customer, and I did. And, and National Chimney does the same thing. So let's move on. So we, you are a business coach, mentor. Tell me about that. Um, well, I, I like to say mentor or accountability partner because I feel like a lot of times people think they need a coach. And some people, believe me, they do. Um, but a lot of times they just need to be directed in the right direction and then held accountable to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do. One of my pet peeves is we go to these industry trade shows and you see the same guy or gal in the front of the room writing notes and they're like, oh, I'm going to change my business, change my business. Then you see them a year later, they haven't done anything because they haven't, they haven't taken that information and done anything with it. Right. And I always say, I'll help you if I have the time and you have the time to put into it. But you know, obviously I'm busy, so I have to pick and choose who I can help. But there's other people in my company that I can direct them to and say, okay, this is this is a better fit for you right now. But at the end of the day, you both we both have to put the time in to make sure that we're going to get the results that that person wants. I mean, that, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I like to say mentor, accountability partner, but coaching, it's, it's all in the same same realm. Well, I mean, really, I mean, so let me, let me kind of just, because I went through all this coaching and, and consultant training Really, what you are really is your your mindset, which is a little bit of coaching, but you're also you're also consulting them on, on what they need to do, right? I, I like to think that I'm allowing you to bring to me the tools that you have. You're just having a little tough time implementing them, so I'm going to help you um, get that 
direction that you need, and then I'm going to hold you accountable because a lot of times people will they have the right direction, but then you know shiny object, and they're they're gone to the left, and then they're gone to the right. So they're 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 not staying focused. But it, it's not like I'm calling the the client every single day. And go, hey, did you uh, did you do your dishes? Did you make your bed? Right. Are you, did you work out today? Right. You no. Know, by the way, did you sign your payroll checks? Like I'm not doing that. But there's a lot of times that individuals they will go a little bit off the beaten path because they're just not staying focused on what the their end goal is, which could be a, a one year, three year, five year plan that they're trying to get after. And that plan is fluid. It's got to change because times change. You know, I mentioned this in a, another podcast I just recently did. You know, if, if you could predict what happened in COVID in your five year plan, and that was in your three year part, then you know what you're you're a bazillionaire, right? Because right? you, you couldn't. So obviously, you have to make those adjustments. Look at the restaurant industry. Yeah, I mean, we're eating outside. They're having to. Some of these restaurants killed it by doing takeout, and others they couldn't because they weren't equipped for that. And, and you can't you can't blame them. They just that's just as fluid as some of those restaurants could be, and it's unfortunate. But that's just an example of that what I say when I'm mentoring someone or or accountability partner or coaching them. I want to see people successful around me. I love to volunteer. I'm part of the Veterans of Foreign War, the VFW. Um, we started a charity about five, oh geez, it's a little longer than that, maybe six years ago, Sweep Away Cancer, which is a, a charity in our industry. Mark Stoner and uh, Tommy Nelms came up to me and asked me if, if I want to be part of it. So we're the founders of that. We have a bunch of volunteers that help us. Um, we raise money to help people that are directly affected by cancer. So you just fill an application online and we'll give you a, some sort of grant if you meet the requirements, which the requirements are pretty loose because we're trying to help people. We're not in this to make money. 100% of the money that we get goes back out, except for credit card processing and the fees for our taxes that we have to pay right. work for the lawyers. But um, yeah, I'm yeah. also part of the CGTLE, which is a Coast Guard Tactical Law Enforcement um, charity where we help people. We raise money to help people that are affected, that are special operators if they're hurt in the line of duty or something happens to their family. Then we've got a couple um, scholarships. Uh, Nathan Brunken, Brunkenthal, he was one of our teammates that uh, unfortunately got killed, got hit by a, a, a suicide bomber. And um, so we raise money, we do golf tournaments and things like that. So I, I enjoy doing those things. Right. Obviously, and running and running National Chimney Natural Life, it's a blast. Yeah. Well, I mean, for Sweetway Cancer, like, we donate – we started, I think, two months ago, donating every month. And like Chuck Roydhouse, you know, one of your reps, or whether he's a, I don't know if he's an owner member or what what he does to volunteer he, for he, you guys. He's on the he's on the board, and he's the um, he's the secretary, and um, he also does some treasury stuff as well. So he's we, a huge asset to the uh, to the board. Yeah, and he finally we finally hooked up uh, and, and called and called me, and we had a nice conversation last. I think it was Friday, and and a lot of that. And, and so yeah, it is. I love. I mean, my mom had breast cancer, and so um, fortunate she had double breast cancer. Fortunately, survived, and you know. But I mean, I, I watched her go through all that, you know. And so, uh, I mean, ten years or maybe more than that, like like twenty years ago, almost now. But but yeah, uh, it's 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 good. One quick thing I do want to say because you mentioned Chuck. I mean, his wife Linda, who um, she also volunteers and does helps out with our social media. So, I mean, people have put a lot of time and effort into 100% volunteers. Yeah. Just like I'm on the board of directors, the executive board of directors for the Chimney Safety Institute of America. I'm the treasurer. Um, Chuck Roydhouse is actually the president. Yeah. Tommy Nelms is the vice president. We have a, a nice big board and everyone's volunteers all to help and give back to the industry. Well, when you need more board members, remember me. I'm new to the industry. I'm the oldest new guy in the industry. They keep going. Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, although I'm the I'm I am the second headed stepchild, I guess, of CCP, which I still, you know, all that. But it is what it is. And so um, I've done my training and I'm now a business coach. And so but I I am getting guys certified. I got a guy going through CSI right now. And nice. so, you know, nice. and I just got just got a guy CCP recertified two weeks ago. So I'm doing nice. both. I just at Plainfield um, last week, I went there and talked to the, the new students just for a few minutes. Uh, Russ Dimmitt was one of the instructors at the time that was there, and so was uh, Jay Cromwell, who uh, yep. who's a rock star out there. And, uh, these guys are just, they're just great instructors. I mean, they know what they're doing. They've been doing this for a while. And even the younger guys that are instructors, they're, they're motivated to have our industry move to the level that it needs to be at. And, we need to be professional. We need to be the in-home cus. We need to be the in-home people that can, the homeowner trust. 
Right. And then when you go in there, this is this is what the this is what's going to cost to do the work. They don't automatically think you're trying to scam them because there is a lot of scammers out there. But I can tell you, there's so many more people doing a good job that are completely legitimate, um, and homeowners should know that. Yeah. Yeah, we actually are at Masters. We're working on. Uh, I mean, we can't get Alan Rush because he's booked out for a year, and so so we've we've sponged. We've as he should be. Yeah. Well, and we've spent more or more. We just hopefully, and I don't get to talk to him enough. And I know this will probably be the second time I've mentioned this, and he hasn't talked to me about it. But we we've got to figure out a way to get him to where he can work bigger, and, you know, not have to and serve more people at one time. But anyway. So we, and I'll just tell you what we did. Uh, we took every Alan Rush we could find video on Surefire, anywhere we could have, and we got them transcribed. And we're just literally trying to just take all the little tidbits we can get out of it to to train ourselves. We're on his list, and I don't care how far we get without him. He's he's we're gonna use him. I don't care, you know. But but until we can, I'm trying to get everything I can get. You know, uh, from what I can get from the knowledge of what I've paid for with Surefire and everything else out there, to to train these guys and how to do exactly what you just said. I mean, yeah. we there's a, this is an industry that's different than a lot of industries that people don't get. We the right ones, the people that we're dealing with on a day to day basis, we actually care, and I don't I don't mean like HVAC companies don't care, but they're such a plumber esque like. It's broken, we'll fix it, this is the price. And that's not what we are trying to do in this industry, right? We're trying to, we have upgrades to like, well, what, what, what do you really want your fireplace to be? You know, what, is, what do you want it to be? You know, and they're like, well, it's never going to be efficient. Oh, well, we can make it a lot more efficient by installing a gas insert here or, you know, or, you know, whatever their dreams might be, we can help facilitate that, but then come into the, that we care exactly about the functionality to keep it safe. You know, we care about what it's going to do. And yes, we are a business and of course there's fees to this, but there is an aspect of most of us are just a little crazy out here with the fires of the roofs, but we're crazy that we care too. And so, I don't know. That's Yeah, you know, it's interesting because like even in the HVAC world or the plumbing world, there still are companies that do care, as you know. Um, but I think in the chimney industry, <laughs> It's, it's more of like a brotherhood and sisterhood, and they're all trying to help each other, and they, they really want the best for the homeowner. And I'll just give you a quick, quick story. So I had an issue with my ice maker at my house. I couldn't figure it out, right? And I'm trying to call the manufacturer. Apparently, this is a discontinued unit, blah, blah, blah. So I, I, I finally get a number of a guy that gives me a number of another guy, and it happens to be an HVAC company called Fellowship. HVAC out of uh, or heating and cooling out of Indianapolis. So I call the guy up. He's like, "Yeah, I can. I probably can't be there for another week or so." I go, "It's a nice maker. It doesn't matter." And he's like, "But if I can fix you in sooner, I will." Anyway, the next day he shows up at my house. Right? He had a, he was at a canceled appointment or something. He shows up. He tinkers around with it for a few minutes, fixes it. And I go, "How much do I owe?" He goes, ah, "Nothing." And he goes, "This was just the problem, you know." X, Y, and Z. And I go, "Well, I mean, I got to pay you. You just came out here." He goes, "You know what? I had another job. Just." refer me to someone or and I go well you know what I also have another problem I think there's too much air coming out of my vents in one of my rooms you want to take a look at it because well I don't have time but I can set you up an appointment well since then he's worked on several of my properties I've referred this company to everyone I know and I can tell you he, he they put new heating a air conditioning units in some places like big jobs all because this guy came over and did the right thing so if you happen to be in the Indianapolis area Fellowship, heating and cooling. These guys are rock stars, and I don't know if they, they listen to your podcast or not, but they do. Like, Probably not. Give me shut up. But, uh, <laughs> but seriously, though, it, the, 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 but that's because these guys did the right thing. Yeah. You could have came and said, you know what, it's three hundred bucks. You know, we tighten this screw. I'm like, God. But they they deserve that money because they have the knowledge. They went to the training, and that's what they they should be getting paid to do. But this guy knew, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna just I'm gonna give this guy a deal. And he's going to refer, to, you know, and that's what I did. It took him what five minutes? Five minutes. And, and I know for, we have this for the first visit. For the first visit. But since yeah. then, and right. And by the way, now he's actually a customer of mine because he actually read my book. His son read my book, and his son works for him. The kid's a rock star. I'd hire this kid in a minute. Uh, I say kid; he's in his twenties. Yeah. But um, yeah, he came down my factory. He goes, "Oh my god, I use aluminum 
um, I lose, use aluminum lining, but I get it from this company. And I was like, he goes, I didn't know you were a manufacturer. That's awesome. So then I got a customer too. You, 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 here's the thing. You don't know. I mean, kind of like our tearful story, which I'm not going to get into. You don't know. Yeah, please don't say it again. <laughs> My eyes are finally dry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. And so, um, so anyway. Real men do cry. Yeah, I know. We really do. You know, my ice maker is messed up. <laughs> it is. Our refrigerator pressure in the water is like, do, 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 and the ice maker is not working. So uh, it's, I would be calling that dude in a minute, in a second, as soon as we got off him, if he was in I Texas. Laughing, but that's exactly what happened. My RO system, the water was going so slow. So I had the RO guys come out. I had all these people coming out. And I, over an ice maker. But then I started fixating. I was like, I've got to get this thing fixed. Yeah. And then it became this chore. And finally, I got this guy's number. Anyway, that's, you just heard all that story. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, okay. Uh, well, we can talk forever. Let me think here. I mean, we're dealing. So, okay. So, let's 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 have a little bit of fun. So, we, what, what do you do in your off time? My off time? I think that's a, almost a loaded question. Like, I, I love <laughs> snowboarding. Yeah, <laughs> I love snowboarding. Spending time with my wife. We love. I love to cook. Um, we like to go out. We're very social people. Um, I hurt myself snowboarding this year in Breckenridge back in January. I work out all the time, but I, when I hurt myself, I had to stop working out and do physical therapy. What run were you on at Breck that, that got you? I'll say that again. What run were you on at Breck that got you? Do you remember? Was, uh, just just above ten mile station. Got it. Yeah, I got hit by a skier that shouldn't have been up there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no. I'm a snowboarder, but um, yeah, I got blindsided, hurt myself pretty bad, um, popped my shoulder out of socket, tore my labrum. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I will say this: I love Summit County. I, we, I went in the '90s. I went there eight years in a row. In Summit, yeah, I love it. Nice. I love it. My wife and I love to snowboard. So, and, you know, we have a boat out in uh, California that I share with my business partner. So pre-COVID, we were out there when the weather's not good. Um, and then, because he was living in Arizona, I think. You know, he was actually living in San Diego, but had an apartment. So we kind of share that. And uh, that's, a, I love being on the water. So I think that's what we, that's, it's kind of the gist of what we do on our off time. Cool. A lot of times, just, she's extremely smart and she's really good in her industry. So I get a lot of tips from her, even though she's, always telling me it's a different industry, but I'm like, so how'd you guys do this? <laughs> <laughs> I won't name her company, but it's, you know, it's a billion dollar company that she works for. So they've got a lot of tools. I'm like, so what did your boss say to do? How, how, what did you tell your employees to do? Yeah. What, what, what is that about? <laughs> right. So that, that, okay. That's a great, that's a great thing. So wh- how many, I don't know if I want to go this direction or this direction. So let, let's talk about what you've done for your own personal development. What have you done? What I've done for my own. Yeah, what, like have you hired a coach or you have a mentor or or yeah, or say, or uh, what have you done? Because if not everybody does the coach, I never did the coaching stuff, but I have mentors. I think I have an advantage coming into this industry that a lot of people didn't coming from the military and in the special operations community. So I think that. There's a lot of training and um, mental awareness that we're, that's ingrained in us for doing it for so long. And then being a government contractor overseas for several more years after that. So then coming into the industry, I don't think I was, de- I definitely wasn't looking for a coach or a mentor. But however, Marty, my business partner, he ended up just falling into that position by being a mentor. He's a few years older than me and an extremely intelligent guy. And uh, so I, I learned a lot of things that from I learned a lot of things from him, and also things that he does that maybe that's not what I would want to do. So then we have this like this this happy medium where okay, this is best for the company. So I would say if you ask me who my mentor was in the industry, um, closest to me would be Marty for sure. And then outside of that, just some good people that are on the board. You know, I love when I love when I listen to Stoner or Chuck Hall. They, these guys have these guys have. Even though it's a different business because I'm a manufacturer, I'm in a mixed group with those guys. And uh, you know the, the knowledge that goes around the room. Hope Stevenson, so she's like to me, she's a wizard, and I say that in the most positive way. She's not a chimney sweep, but her and her husband own an amazing company in Arizona, and I and I listen to what they do. 
and I think I, I, I absorb what all these people are talking about, and then I see how does it fit within my company. Some of it fits right in smoothly, and we make those direct changes, operational or procedural, and then other times I'm like, okay, that's a good trick. Make sure I don't ever do that. <laughs> well, so, I mean, so you don't have the one person, you, you do peer groups. You have a peer group that you lean on right now, or have been. That's correct, yeah. And so, yeah, which, is, which is the mixed group. For those of you who don't know what a mixed group your listeners, so basically, it's I'm trying to remember how many are in our group. We have, I think, 10 companies, and we meet twice a year at their location, one of the locations of the businesses. And then we just basically go through their whole business and figure out how can we help them make it better. They have some objectives that, that, that they want, and they'll say, Hey, I, I'm really having trouble with X, Y, and Z. So then we'll go in there and go, interview their employees, look at their paperwork, and go, okay, this is how we, we as a group think you should do this. And then we give that back to them after a few days at their at their facility, and then that gives them the opportunity to the next time we have their next meeting of how they can make those changes. And that's where the accountability partner stuff comes in. So we'll assign one person in the group to work directly with them, and that will just kind of keep them on track to hit the goals that they want to hit. So let's talk about accountability. We, we talked about it in the pre 15 minutes but we haven't really talked about it here so i'll start with this one and then i'll and i'll let you have it my first year i fired four three or four businesses that i started coaching because i wasn't going to have the same session week after week after week after week i my time is as valuable as theirs and i don't do this i mean i get paid and i love the money but i don't do it for the money I mean, I have grown as a coach in this industry and outside of this industry. I am not even the same person I was three years ago. I mean, not even close. And accountability, and now, so I tell people when I first start coaching them, and because I'm a coach consultant, not just a coach, is if you if if I have to keep repeating myself, and you you bring us to this point because you're too busy, the first thing I do is show you how to not be too busy then you you're not valuing me right i mean and i and i and i'm looking for this to help you and if you're not going to value the help paid or not goodbye i don't need this i'll find yeah. someone that will and so and i don't yeah. have a problem finding people so i mean so you talk yeah. about your accountability stories or whatever you got yeah and i mean we talked about this prior to going on the on, on the, the podcast here just joking me but you know I was at an event I was actually a speaker at the event and at, towards the end there was some questions you know Q&A and someone asked me a question I said I, I'm more than happy to help you but you have to put in the work because if you don't put in the work I, I'm not going to fucking put in the work right. like, why, why, why would I do all this work if you're not going to do the work too so then after the individual came up to me and he was kind of a little bit insulted and uh, he just did like the way I delivered the message but that's me so too bad uh, but I did understand where he was coming from, but unfortunately, that's how I am. So I told him, I said, hey, listen, I can name you five people that are in this seminar that I don't help because they, they they raise their hand every time, I want you to help me. And then at the end of the day, they don't do the work. Yeah. Um, and then there's other people that are in there that do do the work. You know, I have a, a good friend of mine. I won't mention him on the podcast, but um, he, he wanted help, and I've helped him several times, not on a monthly basis, just on a time – Hey, I'm a phone call away if you need help. And you know what? He uses me when he needs help in his business. And that's the effort I put in because he doesn't, he's not asking me to do more. And when he's ready for me to do more and he's ready to do more, maybe there's more of a synergy between the two of us to do that. But at this point, I'm just, I help him when he gives me a phone call and, I, and then he makes those changes. So I think it's important if you're looking for a coach or a mentor, whomever that may be, Find someone that has the same core values as you, the same vision that you're trying to get to, and then obviously compatibility of the relationship. Do you guys get along, guy or girl? And then, um, then you have to put in the effort. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day. My dad always said. Yeah. He also said he, he also said he wasn't the foreman. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I have a chart that's from my training from being a business coach, or I got it after at some. Uh, business uh, coaching uh, deal that we had at my affiliation, and there it's it's a it's a four quadrant box, and it says you know co I don't remember all four of them, but it was coach, consultant, and then mentor, and I believe therapist. Yeah, it is therapist is in the quadrant, and the bottom half therapist and mentor is like like no training 
when it comes to a lot of the systems and stuff, but very helpful and all and all that. And then you have the coach and consultant that is trained and going to charge you more like this stuff is like not free, but you know what it is what it is. And then this stuff up here is like really highly paid. And, and like with me, what they trained us in, in my coaching uh, uh, training was if you go really cheap, you're going to have a lot of people not holding the accountability because it's not worth it right. to them. And when you go really expensive, it's funny how those people really, really, you know, shine and do well with you. You mean if you're too overexpensive, they won't be with you long, but you got to find that happy medium. And so, uh, and I think I found that, I mean, I'm not, I'm not breaking anybody's bank, you know, and, and, but in the same aspect, you know, I'm not free and I don't, I would, I wouldn't, it, I wish I could do it for free, but I have found with people just being enough cheap enough that I'm not going to deal with the, you know, you're going to pay me just for the accountability. And yeah, that, that's I how I do it. I think it's important when people think something's free, they don't put the effort into it because they feel like, and I don't like to use the word, it cheapens the, the, the service you're giving, but it really kind of does because you've spent money to get to where you are mentally and physically in business. Yeah. And now you're going to share those skills and your, your you know, tips and tricks things that worked for you that didn't work for you throughout your career. And, you know, you've been in this business for a long time. It was funny because we were talking, you and I, before, and you're like, yeah, no one knows me, but I've been doing this for years. <laughs> and, you know, we started talking numbers, and I was like, yeah. it's so funny when that, it's such a small group of people in our industry. If you're not if you're not known, if people don't know you, they're like, oh, and then all of a sudden you show up, and like, that's a new guy. Ah, he's been in business for 30. Yeah. Or, you, know, like, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. You just don't know. And yeah. I have customers in our industry that I can tell you that <clears throat> they're very similar to you, that people, they don't go to the trade shows. They don't want to. They have a very successful business. They run it the proper way. And I'm not saying they don't need to go to the trade shows, but um, but th- that's their that's their business. And, you know, they, they, they look at people that they rely on in other businesses to help them. And now uh, they do a phenomenal job. And, you know, they're not the... They're not the 2 a.m. keyboard warriors. Yeah. <laughs> well, we know about them. Uh, yes. Uh, well, it's funny because how we really got involved was a keyboard warrior was on me. I'm just telling the story on the podcast. And if That's you know right. who you are, when you when I tell the story, tough shit. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, I put a post out there, right, uh, on one of the groups. And, and I went to work. You know, I don't know, about 11 o'clock in the morning, I get... Uh, a message from you going sorry man you're getting blown up on whatever and i'm like what and i'm like huh are you gotta be shitting me here and so went on there it's like okay this is ridiculous yeah but, i wanted to let you know because i figured you just sent out a post and you probably left it like a normal human would do yeah and said, <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're like, hey man you know so yeah we became friends and uh, yeah. here we are well <laughs> uh, to finish that story which is funny but all i posted was literally Literally, I'd gotten on there and got approved as outside the business box, not as Chad Murray. So what happened What happened was I put on there, is there anything else? Because we were looking in to get an air duct cleaning. And I had, and we have been looking at it for 15 years. And just, we never really needed it. Well, after having a, such a shit year of COVID last year, we decided, okay, well... Our special plan for the future is to add that one more extra service for the spring months when we're dead, you know. And so, uh, and it would be all year round, but we really wanted to fill these holes that we have. So I thought, well, what else is everybody else doing? So I go on there just as outside the business box. Hey, what you know? What are y'all doing out there for you know other businesses? And all of a sudden, flooding in all uh, the people who are not thirty truck businesses, essentially going going, you don't need to do anything else but chimney companies or chimney work. And it's like, and then all of a sudden one guy gets on there and starts bashing me personally. And that's when yeah. you got on board. And so what did I do? And if you guys, and you've gotten to know me, but other people know me, you know, I have a funny, quirky little, you know, fight mentality to me. So I went in there as myself, got you know, got approved as Chad Murray now, and went on that post and went, who the hell is this outside the business box guy? You know, what is he doing? You know, who does he think he is to ask us about this work? And then these other perpetrators started getting on board, and I don't remember who it was. Uh, someone goes, you realize outside the business box is Chad. Yeah. 
<laughs> and I, I felt like I got my, you know, that was my first haters that I have right there. And so uh, it is what it is. I don't care. They're, they're not, definitely not listening to my podcast. And if they are, hey, maybe you learned something. Don't be such an asshole, you know. Yeah, and so haters, haters motivate me. I, I, I don't think Boom. Yeah. Well, here's the funny thing. I was on a walk with my daughter last night. And I, and oh, two of my daughters, my two middle daughters. And, and we're doing three miles. And and I, we we're on the first mile. And I said, well, what do you guys want to ask me? I always say this to them. What do you want to ask me? Because, I, I, you know, like my dad, like I know a lot about my parents. But my parents don't know shit about their parents. They just, they don't. They, they didn't have that generation where they talked a lot, right? So you don't really know. My grandpa, my dad's dad. Nobody knows who the hell he was before he was 35 years old. I mean, we're talking, we don't know if it was mafia. We have no idea. I mean, like Fort Worth mafia type stuff. You know, we have no idea. Because he definitely had that kind of, per- he was that type of guy. But he was quiet and a big guy and, and he had a presence. And so anyway, um, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. But uh, so, oh, we're on the walk. So I said, well, what do you want to ask me? And so she, and, and Gracie goes, I heard you talking or you posted on one of your posts the other day that when you get someone gets mean to you or something that you play real dirty. What does that mean? <laughs> and, I, and she goes, can you give me an example? I said, well, I don't have an example for you right now, but I'll explain what it means. And it's not right. But if you cross me, I'm not going to lose. <laughs> and, I, and that's just my personality. It just is what it is. You know, and so anyway... It, that, that really, uh, everybody, you know, if, if you want to buy from National Chimney, I'm not, it's not if you want to buy. You, you, you have a very good option to buy from National Chimney. If you want to read one of the best books you'll ever read, Back to Bulletproof. It is, is done. Darren wrote it so well. It's on Audible as well. I mean, I'm doing your plug here for you. Uh, I mean, it really, it's on, it, it is, is an excellent book. And it's not just about business. If you just want to hear a great story it's a novel in my eyes it is not just that it really is i mean there's not i got pissed off when i had to get off two planes because i had to pause it i'm like oh what happens here they're on that gunship or they're going after that shipping ah, shit i don't know you know it's, you know it's like i want to know what they did you know uh it's so it's such a good book and and and, and darren and i have become really good friends and man I appreciate everything you're doing for me and the industry. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. And uh, like I said about the, the book, I'm excited that people are liking it. And I hope people, more people read it. You know, and I, I, I don't care if everyone buys it. If you buy it, read it, give it to a friend. And uh, you know, and I'm on all the social medias. You know, Darren Bebo. All that's just basically my full name on Instagram and all that stuff. So you, you can see some of my videos that I put out. So there's a lot of fun stuff that we do. And I, Hopefully people will enjoy the book, and if you want to do business with me and you're in the chimney industry, National Chimney is always hiring new customers. Well, there's not just chimney stuff. What else do you, you guys do with skylights? Yeah, we do skylights and solar attic fans, traditional skylights and tubular skylights. So my business partner started Natural Light Energy Systems, um, don't quote me, but I think 10 years after he started National Chimney. So we have that business. Then we purchased a couple other businesses along the way. We acquired them to come into our port. port portfolio. We acquired Magnaflex several years back, um, Kennedy Skylights, which we put basically we buy them, put our management team in, then get everyone to follow our core values, you know, get rid of the people that are, you know, aren't part of the team. And the rest of the people that are pushing the bus forward are the guys and gals that stay. And uh, yeah, we've got a phenomenal team throughout the country. So I couldn't be more thankful for how hard my employees work and the dedication that they do to help the customers get the product they need on it every single day. I'm thankful. Guys, and I messed up with Darren here. We needed to talk about culture. You got an extra five minutes? I got all the time. Tell me about your culture because that's just awesome and fascinating. I love how you build you build your business. Talk about it. I mean, I, I think we got a phenomenal culture. We allow the employees and they allow us as a management to communicate to each other to find out uh, you know, what works and what doesn't work. And, um, you know, whether it's extra days off or it's buying lunch for the crew or, you know, giving them spiffs when, you know, it's a million degrees in the hot sun in Arizona and they're trying to get out products or they're staying late on a Saturday. Um, I, I like to think that my team works hard because they want to do a good job, not because we make them do a good job. 
Uh, you know, we follow core values to a T. We hire, we fire, everything off our core values. Uh, it's on our T-shirts. It's on the walls. It's we have these little cards that everyone carries around in their pocket. With oh, their cool! Values. Oh, shit! I need that. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah, and our core values is an acronym. It's honor. So that's how coming from the military filled with acronyms. So it's honesty and integrity, operating at the highest level at all times. Never say never. O for originality, thinking outside the box. And the last one's R, respect the customer, the company, yourself. And my, my team, we created these because that's the way we operate. And uh, yeah, like I said, I think that I think our culture is great. Always room for improvement. Sure. It's one of the things we're constantly working on. And um, yeah, it's fun. That's, that is. So there you go. If anything that came out of this, guys, what he just said is he's actively working on his culture all the time. It's the time. not a system you start and forget. Because when you do that, you just become stagnant and you're right back where you were. You know, No regrets, no limits, and no excuses. There you go. That's the perfect way to end it. So if anyone wants to get a hold of they want to get a hold of you, do you want to put that out there? or, or what? Do you- sure, you can get a hold of me on through social media. Um and like I said, I've got a lot of videos and cool stuff to, that you can watch out there. It's just basically my full name, Darren, D-A-R-I-N-B-I-B-E-A-U. On Facebook, it's Darren Bebo Official. On Instagram and Twitter and all the other stuff, it's just Darren Bebo. Um, and then, of course, if you want to do business with us, National Chimney. It's pretty simple. NationalChimney.com. we got sales reps all over the country that are awesome, awesome guys. I got roofers on here, too. So where do you get skylights from? Where at, put it out there? What what's the email? Oh, or, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. From national, I mean, oh, from it's national all national. Chimney. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We it, it's word. We have different names for the companies, but we all sell the product. So okay. Yeah, natural light energy, natural light energy systems. Um, we're based out of Phoenix, Arizona, and then the traditional skylights, the glass ones. We make those in Indianapolis, also in Florida. So we sh- we make them and ship them all over the country. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on, Darren. Thanks for having me, brother. All right. Take care.